Hello, and welcome to the April 2021 ENSO seminar. We are live today with Professor Louise Barrett from uh, University of Lethbridge in Alberta in Canada. I was I always almost say Canada. Um, <laughs> so, um, I am uh, very happy to be able to introduce Professor Barrett, who uh, has, I think, has a quite a significant impact on our community. The community is sort of in, in embodied and um, and active and, and um, dynamical cognition through uh, her book Beyond the Brain, which I think is probably the most accessible introduction to the sort of the also somewhat alternative way of thinking and sort of. Alternative is an odd phrase, but it's a uh, sort of non non mainstream embodied um, ways of thinking about how the mind works um, and the role of the, the the brain and the body in um, action, perception, and um, cognition and adaptive behavior. Although I also feel um, that you've done great service in making what I think is a very reasonable observation in some of your work that behaviorism is not Satanism, and I think just rolling that. Although partly I also think that maybe we should just um embrace that image a little bit and just, you know, behaviorism can be the metal, you know, of, of, uh, <laughs> of dynamic and, and um, embodied cognitive science. Um, so as we wait for people, we've sort of a few people coming on um, line live on the, um, the, the YouTube channel here. And we might start, I guess, with, um, with a, a bit of a commercial break, as it were, open, open things up with a commercial break. Um, so I will, I guess, first I'll flag just the, the ENSO seminars themselves. It's something I don't do very much, but to, to point out that we have a mailing list for announcements of the seminars. Um, and that sort of makes it easy to look for the live participation link and so on, if you'd like to join um, the seminars as, um, as a live participant in, within the discussion. Um, so if you're interested in joining that mailing list, um, you can let me know simply by sending an email to marrick.mcgann at gmail.com. Um, and the arts, I think our, our, um, our, our seminar next month in, in May will be Alessandro Picella from um, the Wesleyan University. So that'll be something to look forward to. Um, on, I mentioned to you um, when we spoke before, um, Lou, about the possibility of, of flagging uh, something that you've read recently that you think would be of, of interest, so a little, give, give something a little signal boost um, as we uh, before we are uh, basically, yeah, as, as we wait for sort of people to keep watching live. Is there anything that's leapt out of you recently or really caught your attention? Yeah, and um, so um, I, I know that Miguel Segundo Ortin um, recommended this, but I'm so I'm just going to give this a second boost because this is great. I've thoroughly enjoyed this. This was really good. Um, and then I, I really, this this is a very interesting book, Smelo Smelosophy. Some, I can't even say it. Smelosophy. Smelosophy. Um, and what, what um, she does in this book is sort of say, what if we had begun with smell rather than vision as our, as our basic mode of perception? And she does a sort of Bruno Latour thing, goes and talks to people. Kinda, and so, you know, it's, it's written in a sort of, it's, it's quite, you know, it's sort of a standard representational way of doing things. But, um, you know, you can read across that. And it's, I just found it really interesting of saying, like, what would, what, would, what would it be like if we had begun at a different point? So it's a bit like, um, have you ever read Simon Pickering's book? Um, cybernetic uh, brain. The cybernetic brain, yeah. You know, like what would it be if we had started and, and continued in a different direction? What would it look like? And I thought, so I thought this was really good. And then this is a very, this is, um, I'm seeing I'm getting into brains here. <laughs> the idea of the brain by Matthew Cobb, who um, he wrote a great book about sperm and eggs and reproduction and just, you know, he's a historian as well as a um, behavioral neuroscientist. And this is the sort of history of of neuroscience and very nicely done and really engaging. So I really recommend this as well. He writes really well. So yeah, that was that was also good. So yeah, those I can recommend those highly. Excellent. Um, thank you very much. And with art as well, with the, the physical objects in question, it's always good. <laughs> yeah, I did my homework. <laughs> um, so, well, thanks very much for that. Uh, we have uh, a number of people now on uh, live. So, we have um, and you know, one or two people on YouTube already chiming in that they agree with your uh, with the recommendations too. The idea oh, good, of good. Andrew Wilson's there. So 
Um, yeah, so I, I think we're sort of probably more or less caught up at this point. We have um, a, a good few in. I, mean, I think we might have one or two members to join late live, but we'll allow them to do so politely. Um, so and with um, the, the commercial break done, as it were, um, I will invite you to share a screen if you're going to use slides okay. and um, we can move on with the, the seminar. Oh, it says you it says you've disabled screen oh. sharing, Mark. <laughs> Apparently, I have. Um, <laughs> there we go. That would be, that would help, wouldn't it, if we enable that? That should Perfect. work. Now. Thanks very much. Sorry about that. <laughs> that's all right. Okay, so that's showing up nicely. Perfectly. Excellent. Okay, right. So, um, thanks very much for the invitation. It's really lovely to be here. Um, very much looking forward to having a chat about this, so I will hopefully won't go on too long. Um, and I, you know, I know in the abstract, you know, my talk bears a slight resemblance to my abstract as always. Um, and I will talk about. I'm happy to discuss Darwin, but I sort of left Darwin out so I can get to the to the main things that I want to discuss. And I don't know if you've seen the the TV series Derry Girls, which is just a hilarious show about. Um, school girls in London during the 90s and there's this part where they're all freaking out about an exam and one of them Michelle sums up the entire Irish potato famine by going we've got the gist they ran out of spuds and everyone was raging and that's kind of what my talk is a bit like it's like they ran out of spuds and everyone was raging it's just a, an overview of things that I've been um, thinking about and where I kind of came from to to what sort of got me into thinking about ideas to do with mind and cognition differently um, so I was, I was really inspired by Sean Gallagher's book in activist interventions, partly because the range of subject matter that, that he, you could see he's dealt with here that went from sort of everything from intentionality to, to bipedalism. And so this, this inspired me to think of areas of concern for me where an activist intervention was needed. And so here I want to suggest sort of two possible interventions that relate to ideas of evolutionary continuity and theories of human gene culture co-evolution. And that's because um, I have spent most of my career and indeed most of my adult life studying primates in the wild, most pro prominently um, Chakma baboons for 12 years in the Western Cape of South Africa, and for the past 10 years, vervet monkeys in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. Um, and what happened quite early on in the baboon study, which was when, you know, I, I also did my PhD on arboreal monkeys in, in Uganda, and I couldn't see what was going on there mostly. I mostly did their diet and ecology because I could just see things dropping on my head from what they were eating, and uh, that was about it. And I, I only got into social behavior when I studied the baboons. And early on in that time, I experienced this increasing disenchantment with the social intelligence hypothesis, which was the dominant view within the, the field when I was beginning working on, on the Baboon Project. Um, the social intelligence hypothesis as originally put forward by Nick Humphrey and then elaborated on as a Machiavellian intelligence hypothesis by Dick Byrne and Andy Whiten and most comprehensively developed as a social brain hypothesis by Robin Dunbar. So Humphrey's initial idea can be captured quite simply and was based on his observations of mountain gorillas when he was a student first beginning his career, he went to Diane Fossey's site. And, you know, these chaps have relatively large brains, but <clears throat> as he said, they know they live in a giant salad bowl. So what's the big brain for? Their ecological problems do not seem more demanding than those of other less well endowed species. And that raised the question of where the selection pressure for large brains was coming from. And hum Humphrey's hypothesis was that it came from the social world. Um, that as Humphrey saw it, in order to respond to the dynamic contingencies generated by other animate beings, primates needed a specific psychological insight into the minds and actions of others. So he made a case for the primates as, as it says here, social gamesmen rather like human chess players. So they needed to be calculating beings capable of a special kind of formal forward planning. And in such a situation, Humphrey argued, um, social skill goes hand in hand with the intellect. So Humphrey characterized this kind of intelligence as creative in contrast to the kinds of practical intelligence that would be needed to forage efficiently and successfully. So just to run quickly through the reasoning here, um, that began with Humphrey and then progressed through subsequent iterations. We begin with the observed facts of social living and big brains. And those are the two things that we, we have empirical data on. Um, sociality is a response to predator pressure. 
uh, which forces animals to live in social groups and creates competition for resources within the group. That is then argued to select for certain kinds of tactical action that are designed to um, ameliorate the negative effects of competition on fitness related traits, survival, reproductive success. So Humphrey and then Vernon Whiten suggested that these would be particular kinds of social skills. And, and this is where, you know, people like Franz de Waal and his um, chimpanzee politics comes in and all those kinds of early studies. So most notably, it was, no, it was like this, this, the formation of alliances between particular animals, whether <clears throat> at a dyadic level or above, um, was, was important here. This was how the politics played out. So this would involve the formation of coalitions where two or more animals would gang up against each other in a fight. And those coalitions would be serviced by grooming behavior and animals would need to reconcile their relationships if they became damaged in order to, to ensure that their political alliances remained intact through time. Maintaining alliances in this fashion was then argued to be cognitively cognitively demanding in, in particular ways. So animals would need to conceptualize different kinds of relations between third parties. They would need to calculate the extrinsic power possessed by a given coalition. They would need to reason about relations between different kinds of relations. And as Humphrey had already said, they would need to prospectively plot and plan in order to outwit their competitors. So these abilities would also select for the precursors of the kinds of cognitive abilities we see in humans, most prominently language and theory of mind. And from there, you know, because of the cognitive demands of all this, here we get to large brains. Um, <clears throat> in order to have all that, you would need to have a big brain. But what became, you know, started to become apparent to me was you don't see much evidence for, you know, the coalitions and reconciliation cannot operate as organizing principles as suggested because you don't see them as you should, as often as you should in the wild. And it should be apparent here that really the reasoning is running backwards, right? We know that the primates have big brains. So we identify the complex abilities that would justify them. But those are simply untested assumptions, right? The reasoning is not based on empirical evidence. We, didn't, we don't have empirical evidence for the, that monkeys and even apes have these kinds of conceptual um, abilities, this, these, these capacities for prospective cognition, et cetera, et cetera. The, you know, we know that they don't um, show language skills in the same way, et cetera. Theory of mind is, a, is still a, an open question if we, if we even know what theory of mind actually is. So these um, untested assumptions remain prevalent as we moved into the era of empirical testing, which is most notably through Robin Dunbar's work, um, where large neocortex size was assumed to support a highly specific kind of cognitive ability and group size was assumed to be an appropriate indicator of social complexity uh, without very much in the way of independent empirical support for either of those positions. Um, so no independent empirical evidence was presented for the proposed cognitive mechanisms themselves. Um, so, you know, this, this, you know, and the neocortex, you know, I have heard Robin say, it's the thinky part of the brain. And that's what these animals are having to do. They're having to think their way through their lives, their social lives and plot and plan in these ways. Um, and as the social brain hypothesis was then extended to other social animals, that often required the shoring up of these assumptions against empirical evidence to the contrary. So when the theory was extended to other taxa, different patterns emerged. So a case in point being birds, where brain size didn't correlate positively with group size, i.e. The, the theory that you know you need a big brain because the more animals you have to deal with, the more complicated your um, uh, socially, you know, the more complicated social life will be, the more demands it will make on, on, on your cognition. Um, the birds, it correlated with pair bonding which is the smallest possible group size you can have, it's two individuals. But um, this continued to be interpreted in highly cognitive and anthropocentric terms. So rather than seeing being attentive to their mates needs as, for example, a process of embodied attunement and coordination of action, it's being seen as a process of inference and assessment of another's desires and beliefs in a cognitivist and in often an explicitly computational framework because that's a prerequisite for mentalizing and we need to have mentalizing in here because that's what's driving the social intelligence hypothesis because ultimately what we're trying you know it's got to get to sort of human intelligence and the to cohere as a as a overall general theory it has to apply across all the species in which you find these kinds of effects to do with 
um, the, the complexity of the social world and the size of brains. So this is what I've come to call the cupcake of, of over-interpretation. So you have really rich, creamy interpretations made on the basis yes. of mentally thin, dry data. Um, and this is especially so in experimental field studies. So many of those studies involve playback experiments where the vocalizations of group members are artificially arranged into particular kinds of sequences. Those are broadcast to other group members whose responses are then recorded. So call sequences that are held to be surprising because they represent unusual situations like a subordinate animal threatening a dominant animal and then the dominant animal displaying submission in her vocal response, which you wouldn't necessarily, you know, which is would be incredibly rare if, you know, um, doesn't happen at all. That should result in a stronger behavioral response. So that behavioral response is often the number of seconds that the subject animal looks in the direction of a hidden playback speaker. So you can see that's quite limited behavioral evidence. Um, this being so, when you that and, and so Cheney and uh, Seyfarth and Cheney are, you know, they are huge figures in the field. They wrote a book called How Monkeys See the World. They wrote a book called Baboo Metaphysics. And what they have done is to say, okay, they they have their work is to find these precursors, to look for the precursors of language and human social cognition in our primate relatives. So they, in the context of these playback experiments, they have come up with interpretations of this kind. So. Here, a baboon hears vocalizations. She forms a mental representation of call meaning. So there's a lot of unpacking to do there, but really what I want to get across here is that interpretations like this, which are positing the formation of mental representations, the rules of call delivery, those are, those are inferences that are shown at best to be consistent with the stated hypothesis. They're not demonstrations of the existence of the representations or the operation of rules. So, interpretations of the data like this, they're, they're just serving an, an explanatory need. Or, you know, as Tony Chimera says, they're like Hegelian um, explanations. You know, it's, it's, they need this kind of interpretation here based on just like how, this is this is all comes from how long a, a baboon looked at a speaker because it licenses um, the following conclusion, right? That call cool meaning is a discrete combinatorial rule governed and open-ended system of communication. And that, you know, as it happens, just maps neatly onto the definition of symbolic language. So human propositional thought and language are argued to be grounded in more basic forms of knowledge and propositional thought that we see in our closest living relatives. So the reasoning continues to follow sort of the Humphrey logic where he started because he was assuming implicitly that the endpoint had to be human social intelligence of a particular kind. Right, that doesn't necessarily map onto what we really know about how we go about our business engaging with others. Um, and then we project this onto other species to arrive at the kinds of cognitive traits that will ultimately produce that outcome. So we begin with a particular, and I would say scientific construction of human mindedness, i.e. The, 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 the mind that, that science has produced rather than what we know about in our everyday interactions. And then we extend that far back into the evolutionary past and project it onto other species, often quite distantly related species in the case of birds. And we do so in the name of evolutionary continuity to show that humans are different from other animals only in degree and not kind. But we've kind of got our continuity asked about face there because we're taking what's human and extending it back rather than building from the bottom up. So that's to engage in a process that Danielle Moyle Sharrock has, you know, very nicely warned against when, she, you know, in some of her work where she says, you know, when we try to awaken the animal within us, we have to be aware, beware of overly humanizing the non-human animal, lest animal concept possession bounce back in the shape of propositions or content. And Dorit Baron has made a similar point where she said the conviction that there must be some diachronic emergence story that encourages that encourages proponents to overinterpret the mentality and communicative behaviors of the existing animal species and underplay some of the evidently unique features of human thought and language. And this um, again is brought up by Per, um, per Segadal. This is a, a sort of Wittgensteinian interpretation, this chapter in a book um, of bonobo language studies. 
And what the point made here, which I think is lovely, is this teasing out of the fact that when we are talking about what the opposite of human is, it's not really animal, but it's this over-intellectualized, lofty idealization of what we think it means to be human. And that's ironically entirely inhuman. So this, we have this idealizing tendency of what our minds are like um, that has come about through particular kinds of scientific work. And that idealized version is then projected back onto other animals in a watered down and rudimentary form. And so this is what I responded badly to because I wasn't seeing animals behaving in these ways when I was out every day watching them. And so this is when it's like, okay, we need something different. And so we need, and, and the radical embodied cognitive science and inactivism for me does that. And I love this, you know, the Tony Chimero's term, there are no mental gymnastics. Um, applying an, an activist framework to non-human primates frees us from the view that the basis of knowledge is like yet more knowledge. Um, so baboons and vervets who engage with their group mates, they do it with like complete assurance. They are sensitive to the actions of those around them. They adjust to the ongoing flux of behavioral interactions. And I, you know, there's, I, there's, there's no need to, for them to infer what others can see or translate what they hear into, into narratives. Um, you know, to, to put it in as Wittgenstein did, you know, at the beginning is the deed, not the word, not the proposition, but the deed, action, you know, giving reasons has to come to an end. And our hinge certainties are practical in nature. There's a kind of animal, unreasoned, unhesitating belief that can't be meaningfully said, but it can only be shown in our actions. So I can give you an example of this because um, I my focus in the baboon study was um, life history processes, female reproduction, mother-infant interactions. And when a female becomes a mother, the presence of her infant generates really intense interest in other females who will try and approach and handle the infant. They don't always do it gently. Um, sometimes they just run off with the infant altogether. That puts it at risk of dehydration and extreme cases, death. And mothers, you know, not surprisingly, they quite get quite agitated. They avoid when others approach. Um, they avoid any attempts to handle their offspring. Um, but grooming the mother apparently can increase her tolerance for this kind of interaction with the level of grooming dependent on the number of other infants available in the group. So it presumably reflects a level of stress the mother's experiencing. Um, you know, grooming releases endorphins, it calms her down. Eventually handling can occur. But this has been interpreted, you know, in Bernard Whiten's original ideas, this has been interpreted as, as a form of de de deceptive behaviour. So every day here, one can see females approach mothers, pretend to be primarily interested in grooming her. What they really are after is an opportunity to hold her infant, um, but is the mother really deceived? So the idea is that the female comes up and, you know, it's like, I'm just gonna groom you. I don't wanna touch your baby. And then like tries to grab the baby. Um, so the female comes with an intent that she disguises in order to lull the mother into a feeling of false security. And if you watch, what goes on in great detail, if you record the interactions, if you study them um, in detail, if you see lots of them, that's not what goes on. So typically a female will approach the mother and if she's lower ranking, she'll sit at a distance of about two to three meters um, that places her sort of sufficiently out of reach of any form of aggressive attack. Then once she's there, they monitor the mother really closely. They follow her head orientation and gaze and mothers, for their part, often turn their backs as the handler approaches and to kind of force the, ha the handler to begin circling around the mother in order to keep her face in view and the infant. And if mothers can't keep the handler out of their own field of view in that way, you know, they just kind of just don't look at her. They kind of avoid gaze. And as long as that persists, handlers sort of seem paralysed and they're unable to act. They circle around and around and around, but they can't come any closer. And then the mother, um, if they, you know, then there's this kind of thing when the mother sort of inadvertently catches the handler's eye. And that's a cue that the handler moves in and approaches into, like, you know, within arm's reach. Um, so the mother, so once in proximity and with the mother sort of turned away and sort of hunched over the baby, what she's then doing is presenting her shoulder or her back. And as a consequence, handlers more often than not begin to groom. So 
seen in the context of the interaction as a whole, this is not a ploy to deceive the mother, but it occurs because the handler is in an aroused state, she's socially oriented, and she's afforded the opportunity to groom, right? Presenting the shoulder roll back is a standard signal that, that precedes grooming among many primate species. So as grooming continues, mothers relax their bodies, they orient more directly towards the handler, they afford the opportunity to interact with the infant. Um, and that's an opportunity that the handler may or may not take. I'm calling it the handler. I mean, they don't necessarily always handle. Um, it's not uncommon for potential handlers to become so engrossed in grooming that they, you know, I've seen infants go sailing across the, the you know, savanna because um, the, the groomer is, has lost all interest if, it, if they ever had any in the infant. And now grooming is the focus so that they can continue grooming the mother unimpeded. So really infant handling is about two individuals bringing their behavior into coordination in, in real time dynamic fashion. It's not about the execution of preformed goals and intentions that exist in one or other of the animal's heads, right? Both grooming and handling emerge from the interaction rather than representing the goal of it. So I just, you know, this, this view that, that has been generated of what primate life is like is, is completely um, alien to me as someone who has spent time working with wild animals on a, on a long-term basis. And I think that contrary to Nick Humphrey, if we're going to think of, of, of life as a, any kind of game, um, it's more like a jigsaw puzzle and not a chess game. And this, uh, this comes from David Kirsch, um, who pointed out that you know, jigsaws are perceptually hard but intellectually simple. And, you know, and that's why it's the reverse of what, what Humphrey's trying to get out with the chess playing. If you have a tile and the existing layout, the situation, this is quoting from David Kirsch now, the situation wholly determines whether or not the tile can be correctly placed. There is no need to check for downstream effects. So monkeys and their social relationships, you know, they're, they're immersed in this ever-changing sociological landscape and their behavior reflects the constraints and affordances offered by the interaction between their own social role, the environment and the behavior of others. So socially directed action is not sort of an output or a response, but it's the means by which they can ensure they receive particular kinds of stimuli that can guide further useful action in an ongoing cycle of, of sensory motor coordination. And so it's the active living organism engaged in like, you know, the, the hustle and bustle of life, that's where we're going to find the roots of, of, of cognition. So um, I'm, I'm very taken with the work of Michael Graziano, for example. Um, this recent book is a popular account of his work and I liked it because he includes his own experience as a scientist and the role he has played in, uh, you know, in coming up with particular theories and, then, and those being completely wrong and, and getting his, his theoretical position wrong. And it's very honest. Um, and as with most neuroscientific work, um, you have to read it kind of across the grain because it's all couched in highly representational terms. So you have to remind yourself that it's a representation for the scientist in question and not the neurons in the monkey's brain that are doing all the representing. But once you can get it straight, there are two elements of his work that, that are instructive here. And I've, I've referred to his book in particular because of one um, chapter. Um, and first is his work showing that micro stimulation of neurons produces highly coordinated synergistic movement patterns. It's not the case that there are just individualized, um, uh, generalized muscle movements that are then kind of stitched together to enable behavior in, in any kind of general purpose way. Instead, we see the kind of context specific, situated sensory motor coordination, reaching for food, reaching to climb and leap, flinching from danger. That for example, that John Dewey spoke about, these are, um, you know, he calls them ethological action maps. And then the other aspect of his work is, I think more pertinent here, is his work on peripersonal neurons and peripersonal space, which shows how the boundaries of the body are mutable. Um, and so it's unclear whether you have a body schema and then the peripersonal space are two different things or whether the body schema sort of includes and incorporates space beyond the body. But there are clearly motor neurons that respond to objects that are close to the body and not um, uh, uh, do not just respond to actual physical interactions with objects. And the nice thing about this is he shows that there's a mosaic pattern to this, that it's not just one big bubble of interpersonal space around us, but a nested 
set of bubbles that extend and contract with context and internal physiological states, um, basically with, with world involving activities. So how animals coordinate their move movements with the environment reflects what Graziano calls this second invisible skin. And it has this large social component. So neurons show different response patterns to living beings versus other kinds of objects. They respond to entity, entities that enter another individual's peripersonal space as well as their own. And, and to, so once you start looking at the brain in detail, the kinds of things that, that are coming out of, of, of neuro, uh, behavioral neuroscience, and you know, it's nice that they are focused on monkeys rather than being, you know, if you think of them as monkeys as monkeys rather than a model for humans, it's clear that the kinds of things that, that the primate brain is, is um, organized to respond to are the things that we see when we look at animals on their own terms rather than projecting a kind of anthropocentric Cartesian view onto them. Um, so I think this is, you know, this supports the notion that coordination of our bodies in physical and social space is crucial to the kinds of social know-how that characterize monkey interactions. Um, and that's where continuity is gonna lie in our ability to interact socially with others in these kinds of embodied ways. And the reason I, I sort of highlighted his book is because he tells this very personal story about his son, which is also described in this um, article in Eon Magazine, which you can find online. And in it, he describes how his young son had this undiagnosed movement disorder, um, some form of dyspraxia. And that meant he had trouble with social interaction that was clearly due to some kind of problem with his, um, with peripersonal space. And this resulted in him acting in these odd and disturbing ways as far as others were concerned. So he would stand too close to people, he would fall all over them. He had odd movement patterns that made others less willing to engage and respond to him positively. And this included adult teachers. And um, in addition, although he was very bright, could understand his schoolwork well, he couldn't do his schoolwork in any practical sense because he couldn't stay on his chair and he couldn't hold or control a pencil. Um, and, you know, I think that was, you know, that's kind of interesting because it speaks to what schooling requires in a kind of conventional constructive sense rather than what children actually can and do learn. Anyway, so the whole situation escalated to the point where this poor kid who's six years old was excluded from school on the grounds that he was sort of sexually inappropriate with other children, which was just ludicrous on its face, um, but which you could, which, which could be traced to and involved this, this movement disorder. So I'm not, I'm not trying to sort of reduce it solely to this movement disorder alone, but I think you can see it in this kind of, the kind of nested way that say Van Dyck and Wittigen talk about with their horizontal attitude, with this like taking a sideways look. I think it also speaks to Roger Barker's notion of, of behavior settings, that this kid was, you know, he just wasn't behaving as he should in this, in these particular settings. And it, it you can see how it was because of his inability to engage with others in these embodied ways, not anything to do with his understanding of others' mental states or anything like that. Um, so the story has a happy ending, thankfully. But I think it's a great illustration of the way we have our continuity backwards. We assume social skills, including human social skills, are linked to high level mental state attributions. And when in fact, you know, it's this, these embodied forms of coordination that are conserved and central to primate social skills. And that was the more productive place to start when we want to start thinking about what it means to be a social creature. So um, the other relevant finding in this domain is um, <clears throat> one that links to the final couple of points I want to make quickly. And this is this work by Iriki that demonstrated how tools become incorporated into the body schema over the course of skill learning. So here, um, the activity of biomodal neurons in the parietal cortex was measured um, with respect to stimulation of the hand um, and to visual stimuli near the hand. So the visual receptor field of these um, neurons. And after the monkey had had like five minutes of practice raking in food items, the bimodal neurons whose somatosensory receptive field corresponded to the hand showed a change in their visual receptive field. So the visual receptive field elongated and extended to include the entire length of the tool. So the rake became in effect part of the monkey's reaching system. And they had to actively use the tool um, just holding the rake passively had no influence on the receptive fields. And it only took five minutes of, of, of usage to, to, to affect this shift in the receptive fields. So the boundary between ourselves and the world of material objects can also be regarded as very fuzzy. 
And this is relevant to, I think, the human evolutionary sciences in terms of how human cognition is conceived and studied. So there are two hypotheses currently being presented as opposed and um, that are used to generate competing predictions. So there's the cognitive niche hypothesis put forward by people like Steven Pinker, who argues that humans occupy a cognitive niche in which we use cause and effect reasoning to solve our problems. And I quote, these inferences are played out internally in mental models of the world, governed by intuitive concepts of physics, biology, and psychology. And this capacity allows humans to invent tools, traps, and weapons that arise by mental design and are deployed, tested, and fine-tuned by feedback in the lifetime of individuals. So human intelligence results from selection for um, uh, uh, an individualized intelligence that is capable of generating complex solutions to these kinds of novel problems. So advocates of this cognitive niche idea downplay the importance of any kinds of gene culture co um, interactions, and they think they're superfluous. And the cognitive niche, uh, the cultural niche hypothesis suggests that cumulative culture, gene culture co-evolutionary processes are what produce cultural product, products, and no single individual could reinvent them in their lifetime, So, which means we occupy a cultural, cultural niche. Now, perhaps you don't see those as, as, as particularly disparate. I certainly don't, but that's, but that's how it's presented. So this very recent study has been taken as evidence for the cultural niche hypothesis, as it demonstrated that skilled Hadza Boyers, members of a hunter-gatherer group in Tanzania, did not show a full causal understanding of their bows and arrows. So th the authors asked Hadza Boyers questions about how changes in bow design and mechanics would affect their performance. So they would they ask things like, will a bow that is thicker from front to back shoot faster, slower, or show no change compared to a bow that is thinner from front to back? And your bow has a round cross section. Is it possible to make a functional bow with a with a rectangular cross section? Um, so they have a series of questions like that. And what they found was that the bowyers did not have a full causal understanding of their cultural inventions. Um, they could identify improvements to their bows in a number of cases, but there were also a significant number of questions where they just answered incorrectly um, with, result, with respect to the change that would occur and that would have produced poorer bow performance. So the interpretation here was a refutation of the, culture, of the cognitive niche hypothesis and support for the cultural niche hypothesis. But what I think the cultural niche hypothesis is really getting at, in my view, is an implicit rejection of this Cartesian view of mind used by the proponents of the cognitive niche hypothesis. And then, you know, and, and you and there are some people like um, who, who trace this directly back to the social intelligence hypothesis, um, uh, which rests on this classic cognitivist, internalist, individualistic, intellectualized view of mind. Um, so the cognitive niche view really reflects a scientific picture that we have created of the mind, and it doesn't correspond to wild minds. So as um, head Ed Hutchins said, to quote, most of cognitive science, much, much of what cognitive scientists have been modeling is not actually cognition itself, but the formal symbolic tools and systems that human cognition itself created and is now adapted to. Consequently, computational models of the mind are themselves cultural symbolic tools. Um, so what the Hadza study could be said to show is not that that has a lack of full cause understanding, but Bowes lack the kind of understanding of, of causality required by a Western scientific understanding of physics, which is what cognitive psychology's intuitive physics boils down to. It's not seeing things in terms of, say, ecological physics, as Gibson spoke about. What's being investigated, what's, what's not being investigated, rather, is how Hadza Bowyers are regulating their behaviour with respect to the affordances of the bow and whether they can, un they can demonstrate cause understanding when the problems are presented to them in terms of ecological physics and affordances, right? It's really getting at the kind of understanding that can be articulated linguistically and, uh, and that alone. So from, from an inactive, you know, embodied ecological perspective, the cognitive system is not the bow you're alone it's the bow you're plus the bow and arrow and I think you know the bow's body schema likely extends to include the arrow and the understanding of causality emerges in the action of its use there is an experienced physical causal connection between the bow and the bow and it's that system that could be said to understand causality in a direct physical pragmatic way and not in an indirect disembodied representational way that's what 
And art, what matters here is producing a bow that affords shooting an arrow in ways that serve the Hadza's goals. So I think we can reconfigure this not as a rejection of the idea of a cognitive niche per se, but again, as a rejection of a model of mind that confines biological and psychological processes to the brain alone, um, when the more evolutionary approach would actually be to acknowledge the fuzziness of the boundaries of the body um, and, you know, with material objects and incorporate culture into it and not see it as something separate from mind and, and, and treat culture as, as distinct from, as an evolved process. It's part and parcel of the same evolved process, I think. Um, so we need to talk about more like, you know, performative skills here. You know, that's what, what, that's what we're seeing. And those are instantiated in the organization of the entire system. So um, as a final point, I think we can also consider one final way. And, I, and then again, I'm really, what I'm trying to say is anthropocentrism is, is the problem here. This anthropocentric cognitivist view is, is the problem for, you know, primate ev brain evolution and, and the human evolutionary sciences, um, because we, we don't recognize that material culture can generate its own form of agency that acts with us and through us. Um, it's always assumed that technology and tools will do our bidding, that we act on the world and we assume that they can't exert similar effects on us. And this is where I kind of get frustrated with people in the evolutionary human sciences who are so keen to express the need to have um, evolution for a complete understanding of, you know, and the social sciences need to get with the evolutionary project, but they, they never take account of the kinds of work done in the social sciences that could really, really, really help. So I think Bruno Latour's act network theory is useful here. You don't have to see humans and their artifacts as two distinct things. They're, they're actors in a network and you don't have to differentiate between human actors and inanimate actors. Um, and I think that that's not something people are happy with with because they don't like to see agency and intention as anything other than properties of humans alone. Um, and, and it's interesting because we've created this divide between humans and the world, and then we're not equipped to, to bridge it because it's us who've, who've put the barrier in our own way. Um, so the idea is that humans remain in control of their technology at all times because ultimately it gets reined in and shaped by the human mind, but there's no feedback in the other direction. But there is feedback in the other direction, you know, that's that's the point. So um, technology can act as a moral agent. So the way this is Bruno Latour's example, many European hotels put a gigantic key fob on your room key. Um, and that means that your intention to leave your key at reception works by and through the material agency of the key. A sign can't have doesn't have the same effect. Like, Please leave your key at reception doesn't work in the same way. So objects can be seen to be active, but they're active in the way of objects, not in the manner of people, you know, you don't have to kind of attribute intentionality to objects in, 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 a, in the way that we're used to. And I think this is what people sort of trip over. But um, I can just finish off here with the example of Katahoyuk, which was this very large Neolithic settlement in Southern Anatolia, um, which existed from about 7,000 BC to about 6,000 BC. Um, and the houses here were built of smectic clay and that's clay that expands really quickly with water and then shows really massive shrinkage when it's dry um, and what Ian Hodder says in this book is that the relationship between molecules in the clay produced relationships between people in society at Katahoyuk as they worked to solve the problems of collapsing walls because that's what happened so they had big wooden posts, they covered walls in plaster, they doubled the thickness of the walls, they started making thicker walls, they used bigger bricks, they went to use sandier clays, um, there was shifts in brick technology, they began using moulds and the bricks were laid out to dry. Um, you know, the making of stronger, more stable bricks involved much more labour and work. So people got trapped by bricks, is what Hodder says. They were forced into new relationships with the things that they created. Long-term relationships of material investment, care and maintenance. Um, so they were forced to in invest more to stay in the same place. And that led to innovations like cultural innovations, cumulative cultural evolution. But it came about because the objects were acting on the people as much as they were acting on, on the objects. And that also gets uh, as another kind of fuzziness that we need to emphasize. And then a quick plug for my favorite, other favorite tea free program, which is the repair shop, um, which is to highlight the emotional aspects that are important here too. So in this series, which I can thoroughly recommend, people bring treasured possessions that are all a bit wrecked and they're fixed up by these, you know, amazingly skilled experts. 
And what it makes clear again is, is how objects pull us into these chains of care. Um, and they form material memories in really deeply emotional ways. So Danny Miller, the, who's a social anthropologist, has written extensively on, on material culture and, and these ways. And he's got a lot of, he's a book called The Comfort of Things, which gets this across that, that we, we forget how emotional material objects are. So that was just a quick sketch of how and why a better philosophy of nature, as, as to use Sean Gallagher's terms, we do need it, even if you can't study it very easily, because that would enable the better science of evolutionary processes relevant to understanding primate lives. Um, we can do so by emphasizing fuzziness where the conventional view sees strict demarcation and we, and, and we need to reject the only fuzziness that's permitted by the conventional view, which is this anthropocentric view of continuity, where other species possess these kind of pale shadows of our own more clear cut abilities and which they, and that's that's only there to serve an explanatory need rather than account for the actual data. So I think we need to finally reject the anthropocentric view that allows us to remain sharply defined at the center of a world that we merely observe, rather than seeing ourselves and our closest relatives as as fuzzy forms of life in which we are engaged and participatory. So thank you very much for attention, and um, I look forward to having a chat about all this. Stop that's wonderful thank you thank you uh, thank you very much for that so it um a very rich um set of ideas and and um issues to raise there i as usual i will um we have a, a number of people here so i will let others speak first um but because we have a number of people here i might actually have to chair just to be on the safe side so um wave um, frantically at your webcam um if you'd like to come in You'd like to make a, a particular comment and now i can't actually see everyone either so hang on a second i'll <laughs> see if i can extend things here to make sure that i can see everyone who might be involved um can i just ask as well and i mean in essence does that commit us to a um a kind of a uh, an evo devo approach essentially the your i mean once you've got material agency in the thing once you're essentially talking about a co-evolution with material culture, um, does it commit you to a particular evolutionary ideology or, or sort of theoretical framework, or do you think you know that there's still a wider open conversation to have on this? I think it, I think it's still I think it's still quite wide open, and and at the moment I think I am. It's kind of it's it's it's. Um, slightly more net you know it's not really a positive thing that I'm saying at the moment it's kind of slightly negative in the sense I'm just trying to show what's 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 wrong with the ways in which we are people are thinking about gene culture co-evolution and then they keep going but how do we bridge the gap between culture and humans and it's like well you've put the gap in there and the reason you can't bridge it is because you've you've created a stupid gap right you don't have to have it there you can think about these things differently and but but in but it can't it's sort of people get in their own way. So there's like cognitive anthropology with Dan Sperber and it's all, you know, his, his idea of like cultural tractors and, and, and what happens there is that there are, you know, culture takes certain forms because the human mind is a kind of, is always going to push, push things into certain directions and you'll see certain patterns emerging. And, there's, and it's all very one way, you know, there's never a kind of feedback loop into how the creation of, of different forms of culture literally changes how we can think in a, in a Vygotskyan sense, you know, you can go back to, to various people, George Herbert Mead, you know, it's all, it's all already there. And then it, but, but somehow the mind always has to be sealed off from the world and, and act on it. And that's because, because it all has to be produced in the brain. And it's just the sort of um, getting in, I think, feel like people are getting in their own way and because they won't be open to an alternative. And I think that they don't like it because it doesn't sound scientific enough you know it's they, they worry that when you start using terms like sense making or anything, it's like oh this just sounds like californian loopiness it sounds like people sitting worshiping crystals and and it's like well not really and what people are saying in these alternative views is no more i think i love what andy clark says it's no more daft than thinking that brain meat is doing all of this but like you're completely happy for some porridge in your head to be doing all of this work that sounds more magical to me than actually you know things you can see people doing in material 
practical, physical, you know, pragmatic ways. But it's it's just really hard to break. So yeah. But I think the the framework the, to be produced is wide open, and I, I obviously I think sort of evolutionary developmental stuff has a lot to offer. Um, but yeah, the, I think it's all there to be taken. But we definitely need a better framework. You're, you're muted. You're Marek. muted, Marek. Marek, you're muted. Sorry, thanks. Uh, Mario, <laughs> uh, you've been there, and then Mason has his hand up as well. So if we go in that order. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, thank you, Marek. Um, thank you very much, Luis, for, for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, um, what do you think about the the uh, ascription of, of goals and uh, uh, in general to take a kind of teleological approach to the interpretation of uh, animals' behavior in general. Uh, I mean, um, it's, it's pretty clear that uh, you reject uh, the mental gymnastic in, sense, in the sense of internal representations of, of goals, yeah. but uh, uh, the representational version of teleology is not the only one. You, mm. You, you, you can have, uh, for example, some, uh, in some inactive uh, literature, uh, a, a kind of teleological approach that comes without representation, comes grounded on more uh, sort of biological intentionality or something like that, uh, but uh, which uh, it informed uh, uh, by some Jonasian and therefore Heideggerian existential existentialist interpretation of animal animals uh, and that's an, a, a different way of teleology uh, without representation but it's still teleology uh, what is your I wanted to know what, what is your opinion about that is, is it the problem just in the internal representation of goals or or would you call a uh, this more inactive attribution of teleology also a way of, of anthropomorphism. So that's a, yeah, that's a great point. Um, I would I would say that my problem is with the ascription of uh, in a representational way. I don't have a problem thinking about it in a biologically grounded way, and I think that comes about because because um, Harry Heff said it very nicely. You know, like when you think of psychology, he said it has a flawed ontology. It's based on inanimate machinery. It's not based on on, on biological systems. And I think if you if you take a, a view on biological systems and think about evolutionary processes, then I think you can sort of say yes, you can talk in a, in a teleological way, but you don't have to put the the goals in the animal's head in these kind of representational ways. I don't, I don't have a problem thinking teleologically in those broader senses of, of life, you know, trying to resist the second law of thermodynamics. That seems to me absolutely necessary. Otherwise we're all just gonna like, it's just gonna be the heat death of the universe, isn't it? So, so that kind of way of thinking about it, that there is, there is something to keep, you know, you have to kind of keep life going, right? That's what we're doing all the time as organisms, resisting, entropy that to me seems like you can talk about that in in as a as a as a goal of life um, and maybe i'm sort of neglecting nuances and you know particular philosophical things there that that need to be brought out but it doesn't seem problematic to me to think of that if you think of what of biological systems if you take that as as your basis as your ontology it seems unproblematic to me Thanks, Mason. Um, thanks very much, Louise. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I've now got a huge list of things I really need to go, need to go read, based on <laughs> what you've just been telling us. Thank you. Um, I have a minor comment and then a, a general sort of enthusiastic question encouragement. Um, I always read Bernard White and especially Andrew White, and perhaps as being kind of yeah, the Machiavellian hypothesis sounds kind of cool, but it's really hard to find any actual evidence of deception that can't be just sophisticated behavior interlocking with other behavior kind of. He doesn't quite, he's still over cognitivized it a little, but he always struck me as somebody very hesitant to go full mentalist on a lot of animal sophisticated behavior interactions that this could be explained by the kind of explanations you were just using about the mother 
presenting her back that elicits grooming kind of explanations. So I know I want to go back and read Andrew White and again, I probably haven't picked up Machiavellian intelligence for 25 odd years um, and just reread it given what I think now about how social interaction works and see again, whether that mentalizing is really me expecting him to try to talk that way or is he avoiding talking in this mentalistic way? Do you, have you read it more recently than me? Do you recall? I think that's a fair comment. I think, I mean, Andy is, you know, he's often written about sort of, you know, things like intervening variables and, you know, he's kind of been, but, but I would say, so I think the point is that possibly calling it Machiavellian intelligence was a big problem because it immediately got everyone thinking, you know, and, and so it's often not the people themselves who put forward a position, it's the way people take that position and, yeah. and um, you know, expand on it and, and treat it and, and take it too literally. So, so yeah. That sounds very fair. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, so I think like, one of the things in Machiavelli intelligence was like, I think it's their, um, um, there are sorts of people bringing interpretations to these things and, that, that don't necessarily need to be there. And the second volume of it as well, I mean, he even had a, pay, a, a chapter by Ed Hutchins in it where he tried to bring in a more distributed account. And I don't think, I don't think anyone ever reads that chapter. I don't think it just didn't take, you know. I so don't it's think not I like, did it either. Yeah, so it's not like it, 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 it wasn't <laughs> attempted, but, but yeah, I think these things just, people just like it. The, you know, my husband always says, nobody loves a non-human, non-human primate. We want them to be, we want them to be human. And that's what we, people so, like to do. This, this was the other part that I'm kind of enthusiastic about but rethinking in my head now. I mean, I've been arguing for a while about sort of embodied and culturated cognition. Often we're far too individualist about this. We look at an individual and the stuff around them and the things happening around them and how do they understand the world and interact with it rather than looking at norms and institutions and practices and material culture in this sort of institutional rather than individual way. And there are a lot of things we are doing together, figuring out together, negotiating together. Um, and it seems like the sort of anthropomorphizing, mentalizing, I now want to start looking at the sort of anthropomorphizing, I mean, elements of sophisticated human culture and practices and norms that we should, I mean, we definitely see in animal cultures, although most of us don't want to see animals as like having a sense of what's what it's appropriate to do. I mean, Franz de Waal often jokes that if you don't think that's true, I'll throw you in with the chimpanzees and they'll tear your arms off if you don't figure out how to behave appropriately. Um, so there are these sort of institutions and norms and cultural aspects saturating animal cultures as well as human cultures. But we often look for like tool use and these very humanized ways of thinking about sophisticated culture and how it spreads and how uh, it still seems very different in the ways we want to see it. We want to sort of promote the animals, are they like us in these sophisticated tool normative kind of ways rather than seeing us as a very minor and language and look at all the cool things we do, extension of what the animal practices and institutions and norms and so on are. Yeah, I um, think I think that's true. So, we, yeah, I mean, there's this very, you can see this very strong anchoring, um, you know, like, Whenever, whenever a chimpanzee can do something, it is capable of human-like reasoning. And it's yeah. like, that thing's got a brain, a 300cc brain. If, if a chimpanzee can do it, it must mean we're not as clever as we think we are. You know, it's just our intelligence is probably a bit more mundane. But it's always yeah. like, bring the chimpanzee up to us. And then chimpanzees, like, we can recognise ourselves in mirrors. Chimpanzees, let's see if chimpanzees can do it. And then it's like, can dolphins do it? And can, you know, like, why would a dolphin want to do it? You know, it's got echolocation and it's so cool and it can see inside other dolphins' bodies. Like, why would you want to, why does it care about mirrors? But then it's like dolphins become aquatic apes and corvids become feathered apes. And so, and then it all just anchors back to, to humans. It's, it's, it's yeah. all the wrong way around. It's completely back to front. I'm, I'm now looking at rereading a whole bunch of cool stuff in that. Thanks. So Thank you, you very much. Read, you need to read Machiavelli Intelligence. I think Daniel Dennett's got a chapter in there, and there's this whole big thing in it where he talk, he gets all yeah. into a conniption about whether they hide, whether Cheney and Seyfarb hide the speaker or not. Because if they don't hide the speaker, it kind of throws everything. Because if you can if you plonk a speaker down in front of a monkey and you play an alarm call, you play this thing, and the, the monkey doesn't respond as though, um, the, you know, he doesn't yeah. respond any differently to it being a monkey, even though it's a speaker, it would just it would just throw all that out immediately. And then he's like, he's very reassured 
because Cheney and Safar say, to, you know, they assure him that the speaker is well hidden. And my thing is like, well, what if you did leave the speaker out in the open? And I can tell you, we did it with our verbets. We redid the Cheney and Safar alarm call stuff. And if you leave the speaker out in the open, they respond in exactly the same way. They don't, they don't go, oh, that's like weird. That's a speaker making that funny noise. That's a box. They respond as though it's a monkey. So this idea of having to hide the speaker was, again, not an empirical thing. It was like, hmm, if they know it's a box, they won't respond in the right way. We have to make them, you know, we have to ensure that they, they, they think it's a monkey. And that, again, is just, that's a projection of, of our thought and, and how we see the world onto them. And no one empiric there was no empirical test as to whether they would care if it was hidden or not. And in our verbets, they do not care. Thank you very much. Um, so, Fred, you wanted to come in? I think you might be the last. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise. A wonderful talk. Um, I'm pushing an open door here, of course, in, in uh, the overly intellectual anthrop anthropocentric construction of mind on a single neurocentric perspective. But we in the embodied and an active community have our own problems here somewhat in that we seem to be confused when we're talking about persons, systems, organisms and animals. Each of these words bringing all kinds of distinctions with it, like you can kill and an, you, 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 you can kill an animal, but you can't have sex with it, but you're not allowed to kill the human, but you, can, you know, it, it's, it's kind of weird. Um, in some respects, we're, we're still in the position, I think, like the late Victorians who had been told that they were in the natural order and not demigods by Darwin, but they didn't know what to do with this. But that made society something now that you could question and study scientifically. And they were freaked the hell out by ants because of the determinism of ants organization and by chimpanzees because these were their neighbors. But if we get away from, from the, the manner in which the brain is thought of in, in the rationalist cognitivist mode. Um, are you aware of the, the von Economo neurons, the spindle cell neurons? Mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. the only morphologically different cell type between eight, great, greater ape brains and monkey brains. And then we find them through processes of convergent evolution in elephants and in cetaceans. Now, being an inactive embodied sort of person, I'm not gonna give a functional interpretation, but you can't miss the theme of empathy running through here and care for each other because this we recognize that of ourselves in the elephants and the cetaceans. I wonder, can the can the brain speak back to us? Can we avoid this? And avoiding this anthropocentrism is really, really difficult, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and we, I think, as embodied cognitive scientists, have our own problems there. Because, but but when I, I wonder what your thoughts on on, on the these commonalities that don't come in the line of species descent, but do come somehow from complex social order. Um, have you any thoughts on, on, on those? I, I mean, I think one, I think is that sort of, that is how you have to do it. And I think that, that you're thinking ecologically then, you really are thinking, okay, what, what happens in these circumstances that would produce these kinds of things, right? And you, you don't worry about whether this monkey shouldn't be able to do this because it's very distant, you know, capuchins, what the hell do they think they're doing using stone tools? They're very distantly related. They're, they're South American monkeys, for goodness sake. They're not meant to be the clever ones. It's meant to be the old world monkeys. So I think, it, you know, Nikki Clayton with her episodic memory in, in Scrub Jays freaked everyone out. It's like, what the hell are Scrub Jays doing with episodic memory? And there's a big rush to try and show that chimpanzees could do it as well. Um, and I saw, so <laughs> And, you know, so I think this thing of like saying, I'm all for that because there's no re I, I think these kinds of ideas to do with, that's when we get our um, views on parsimony wrong. You know, we kind of think, oh, it's very, part you know, you need to have like a parsimonious explanation of how you get to these things and having it all over the place doesn't seem very parsimonious. And it's like, well, evolution isn't parsimonious, right? It's had millions of years to produce these messy uh, solutions. And if it's all a bit, you know convoluted and you know then so be it and you would expect to see these things coming up under this under similar selective conditions so elephants and cetaceans and like you know that you, you can find a commonality in terms of being long-lived mammals who experience um a wide variety of varied conditions through their lifespan that would need to have a large see i think what's the what we're really trying to explain with big brains why do you have so many neurons 
why do monkeys need so many neurons? That's really the question. And the argument is, oh, somehow cognitive things require more neurons, but, but pattern recognition requires a big neural network, right? And if you're a long-lived animal and you live in a variable environment, you're going to experience a lot of patterns throughout life that will vary and be unpredictable. And a big pattern recognizer seems like a really good thing to have. So you can, you know, thinking about it in those terms gets you where, gets you where you need to be. And the thing about von Economo neurons, I think is, you know, they're also kind of found in big animals. And my friend Rob Barton says, you know, maybe they just need to be long because their brains are bigger. Do, do you know what I mean? It's not about empathy or anything. It's just when you're trying to make a big brain, you're going to need bigger axons and things. You know, it's, it's, a, it's just a structural thing that we are interpreting in a particular way that need not, that need not, um, be related to those things at all maybe maybe it is maybe it isn't but we don't really understand enough about how brains evolve as brains so he's he works he's shown that it's the cerebellum that is um has shown accelerated evolution in in apes and humans it's not the cerebral cortex at all it's the cerebellum and so you know his thing is like let's look at what at well, how brains actually evolve before we start assigning you know particular kinds of uh, abilities to brains because once we understand more about the brain that it's kind of like the ecology of the brain itself needs to be understood better so yeah i think you need to keep keep an open mind about all possible explanations of why brains look like they do and the things that they get up to so yeah but yes that's a that's a really excellent point thank you very much well, um, we are over time and I, I don't want to keep you um, for, for too long. You've already been very generous with your time um, and with your work. So I would like to say thank you. Uh, well, first of all, again, hey, hey, uh, <laughs> thank you very much for um, presenting and, and uh, being with us today. And um, the discussion is also potentially can continue on the ENSO Seminars uh, webpage. So if you sort of subscribe to the um, the discussion forum sometimes things can, things can can kick off there um but yeah i just want to say and um, thanks very much that was uh, very rich i really enjoyed that um excellent talk and um i'll say to uh, our live participants and to others watching thanks for showing up and hopefully we will see you in a month's time for our next Enso seminar it's great thanks very much it was great it was such a novelty to see different people i could have <laughs> I could have stayed here all day. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, and that is...